Welcome to Wealth of Useless Knowledge, where we dive into some fun and entertaining topics. You're sure to learn something new here, and maybe even have a laugh or two. Now let's get into today's video. We all have fond memories that we recall from time to time. Whether it's a fun board game we used to enjoy playing on family game night, or an iconic line from one of our favorite movies. Nostalgia is one of the ways we reminisce in conversation and a way that we keep a solid grip on our existence in an ever-changing world. But when Mandela effects came about, they attempted to turn the way we remember things upside down, leaving our jaws dropped, minds blown, and questioning everything we ever thought we knew. In this video, we'll be breaking down what a Mandela effect is, where it came from, and take a look at five real world examples that will blow your mind. So grab a snack and stay tuned. So some of you may be wondering by now, what the heck is a Mandela effect anyway? The Mandela effect is known as a psychological phenomenon that occurs when large groups of people misremember images, events, and other facts on a wide scale. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, the term was coined by author and paranormal researcher Fiona Broom after speaking with a staff member at a fiction and fantasy convention back in 2009. She discussed with them her memory of Nelson Mandela, the South African anti-apartheid activist and president passing away in prison in the 1980s and the aftermath as she recalled subsequent speeches and protests that she thought occurred in the wake of his passing. The Britannica article goes on to say that upon Broom learning that Mandela was still alive, she initially dismissed her memories as a result of a misunderstanding. However, she was still struck by the similarities in memory that others had as well, and thus she coined the newfound theory, the Mandela Effect. This theory highlights the similarities in memories that the masses have that don't quite align with recorded history. Some of these memories can be easily debunked with a bit of research, while others are more difficult to prove as access to some historical records are harder if not impossible to locate, leading some to speculate whether or not this is a case of alternative universes colliding like we're in a real life Marvel film, or just some flaws in our ability to recollect memories with complete accuracy, specifically those pertaining to pop culture. Some Mandela effects may not have much proof available at all, while others, even once widely debunked, have still left people scratching their heads and questioning their entire existence. In this video, we'll be taking a deep dive into five Mandela effects and some possible explanations for them. First on this list is the Monopoly guy in the monocle. Many of us have played Monopoly growing up and have fond memories of the game, from setting up the board to deciding who gets to play as the top hat. Whether or not you were good at buying up properties all across the board, or were just stuck going bankrupt all the time, the game nonetheless provided hours of entertainment. In modern times though, the game has been looked at not for just how fun it was to play, but also for the Monopoly man's appearance. Many people distinctly remember the Monopoly guy being dressed up all dapper in his suit with his little monocle posing next to the name of the game on the box. But apparently this was never the case. Check out this old commercial for the classic game. How did I make it big? I know how <laughs> to play the game. I buy real estate, hotels, fancy cars, even railroads. And I take chances to make it big. Uh-oh, you've got to play the game. I'm Monopoly Game. After noticing there wasn't a monocle, the next logical question would be, okay, so where did we get the monocle from then? It didn't just spawn from nowhere, right? In a Slate article entitled The One-Eyed Man is King, written by J. Brian Lauder, he talks about how monocles became associated with wealth, even citing a 1950 article from Optical Journal which states from the beginning, the single lens carried with it, quote, an air of conscious elegance. But why did the tiny lens become associated with wealth? Well, the tiny glass lens was not just practical for reading small text, but it was also a fashion statement and a status symbol of sorts. Monocles, although small in size, tended to require a lot of custom craftsmanship, as everything from fitting the eyewear to the wearer's unique face shape, as well as adding the raised edge on the frame, plus custom fitting the right chain or string was quite the task, making the process of obtaining one far too expensive and impractical for most everyone outside of the super wealthy aristocrats. 
Since the Monopoly man Milburn Pennybags, also known as Rich Uncle Pennybags, is wealthy and does wear a top hat and had a cane like many aristocrats did at the time, him having a monocle too just seemed logical enough to fit the bill. Another seemingly plausible explanation for this that does come up quite often is the Planters Peanuts mascot, Mr. Peanut. Both mascots were out around the same time and both were frequently seen, as commercials were often being aired for both products. Both of the characters donned the attire of those in the upper echelon, like the black top hat and the cane. The only difference is that the peanut guy does in fact have a monocle. Considering both Penny Bags and Mr. Peanut, are both highly recognizable mascots, is it possible that we could have just conflated these two to create a completely new character in our own minds? Another Mandela effect that had people scratching their heads in disbelief was the Randy Jackson, it's a no for me dog. This famous quote was one that most everyone thought they'd heard the American Idol judge say all the time, or at the very least a few times. So it sent people into a tizzy when discourse online saying that he never said the memorable line started happening. There was previously a video floating around of Randy saying the iconic line on American Idol. It's definitely enough for me, dog. But it is noted in the video that he's sitting next to rap superstar Nicki Minaj, who was a judge on the show during its 12th season, which aired back in 2013. Considering the term was coined in the late 2000s, one could argue that the statement may have been said after the fact, as a play on the public discourse surrounding it, but it's really hard to say for sure. But years later in 2019, a YouTuber by the name of Filipina Gamer Mama was able to locate Jackson saying the iconic line, which she cites as being found in season 5, episode 3, during the audition phase of the show. Take a look. No. Randy? Uh, it's a no for me, dog. I don't think it was really... Season 5 of American Idol aired back in 2006, so it seems as though this theory has finally been debunked. But let's be honest, even if it wasn't, most would still swear that it was something Randy could have said, simply because it sounds like something he would say, given the amount of times we've heard him say, it's a no from me, or just the word dog in general. Oh, dog, dog. Yo, dog, dog. It's on that. Dog, I gotta say no, man. I just... Oh, dog, dog. Yo, dog. Dog. Yo, dog. Oh, All right. Next on the list is the Fruit of the Loom cornucopia debacle. Now this is one that still to this day has so many of us flabbergasted. We were flabbergasted. It's constantly up for debate amongst people, even though it's been debunked by several articles online, newspaper clippings of logos past, and the company itself listing previous logo designs on their website dating all the way back to 1893. This one though really threw me for a loop, cause like so many others, I too remember the cornucopia being present as well. In researching the topic, it is more common to come across evidence that it did exist rather than it never having existed at all, but this one is just so convoluted. So let's break this down into bite-sized pieces, much like the fruit from a cornucopia, shall we? So for those that believe there was a cornucopia in the logo, there have continuously been those pointing to remnants of its existence. Look at him. Look. Look. Via relics from the past, such as old t-shirts or socks, or even signs where it's present, to which the company attributes those instances as either being, quote, creative photoshopping, or the images of a, quote, counterfeit apparel item. In other words, you guys, they hit us with the shaggy. It wasn't me. It is widely known, though, that knockoffs of popular brands do exist all over, so there's no denying that as a plausible explanation as to why people could get their hands on such merchandise. It's also worth noting that many of us colored in a million and one cornucopia coloring sheets every fall in grade school. So the image of a plentiful cornucopia is just perhaps burned into our memory from that. But the cornucopia saga didn't end there. Many people on Reddit continuously point to the shrunken scene in the 2006 animated film Ant Bully as being somewhat of a residue as we find yet another breadcrumb of its possible existence. Check this out. In the scene, the underwear depicts the cornucopia full of fruit alongside the phrase, fruit of the loin, 
as a play on the popular brand. But not so fast. But wait, there's more. Some would attribute that change to the logo and name as a way to avoid copyright and would say it's nothing more than merely a silly piece of pop culture just for giggles, attempting to make us all believe in something that didn't exist. Needless to say, this is a funny yet baffling observation. However, the last but perhaps the biggest so-called proof that the cornucopia existed was the original trademark filing listing the words Corn of Plenty and Cornucopia on the official document. This seemed to be the explanation we were all looking for and people could finally validate their memory and put the topic to rest, right? But alas, this too would have an explanation. In response to the popular Mandela effect floating around, the company has since come out to explain in great detail the reason for this on their FAQ page, citing, quote, Fruit of the Loom in over 170 years of manufacturing has never used, applied for, or registered a trademark design slash logo depicting a cornucopia. A recent post on social media appears to have referenced a crop picture containing only a small portion of a trademark design application originally applied for in 1973 by Fruit of the Loom, Inc. with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office for use with laundry detergent. One of the key components excluded from the cropped image in the social post was the actual trademark design, which was the subject of the application. That trademark design pictured below was ultimately registered in 1974 and allowed by Fruit of the Loom to expire in 1988." End quote. The company even dropped a link to the full application that includes the actual trademark design readily available for the public to view. In addition, the FAQ response also goes on to say, quote, the only portion of the trademark application shown on the social media post was the design code and description, 05.09.14, baskets of fruit, containers of fruit, cornucopia, corn of plenty. These generic descriptions were assigned by a USPTO trademark examiner, not by Fruit of the Loom, to make images more searchable in the total USPTO database that houses all U.S. trademark records. These design codes are a component of any trademark application for a design trademark. Under trademark law, the trademark owner is only allowed to use the trademark design as submitted with the trademark application. Simply put, Fruit of the Loom submitted and received a registration for the trademark design and not the design and description code. Therefore, the brand could never unilaterally decide to include a depiction of a cornucopia because it did not exist in the design for which we applied and for which a federal registration was granted." End quote. Beyond their explanation, as well as the dropping of said receipts, there was even a retweet of a response to a customer from the company in 2020 on then Twitter, now known as X, stating that the cornucopia has never been a part of their brand history. The company has taken the cornucopia debacle in stride and even toys with the theory from time to time as they tweeted again in 2022, poking fun at believers of its existence when stating, quote, did it hurt when you realized our logo never had a cornucopia? And yet again in 2023 in reference to a crossword puzzle question. To this day, they still find clever ways to play with the public's beliefs in the cornucopia, as just recently as last week, they dropped this tweet. In addition to the company's direct statements and countless tweets on the subject, they even have links to a couple of other articles listed on their website written by other people that debunk the widely held belief in the cornucopia too. Look, y'all, Fruit of the Loom said that's their story and they're sticking to it. I said what I said! Even though this one, for the most part, has been widely debunked, many of us are still left side eyeing, scratching our heads, and in complete and utter denial. I mean, the cognitive dissonance of it all. But alas, this is one of those that keeps coming up time and time again, and it's pretty trippy. So let me know what you guys think in the comments, because I'm dying to know if you're okay with tossing aside your long-held belief that it existed based on the evidence we have available, or if you're going to still hang on to the distant memory that it did exist, no matter what they say. Let me know. Another one is the spelling of the popular household product, Febreze. It's Febreze, not Febreze. 
Okay, so this one isn't as commonly discussed, but it's still interesting nonetheless. As Febreze is one of those things that most everyone has sitting around. Whether it's to freshen up the couch pillows or get rid of pet odors, it's one of those things people just always have had handy. And most never really thought about how the name of the product was spelled, we just knew Febreze when we saw it. So when this Mandela effect hit the interwebs, it really had people running to grab their bottle from the cleaning closet to check. Funny thing is that a lot of people remember it having two E's in the name, but there's never been any proof of that being the case. So why would people say that? Oh, why would you say that? Well, one good reason for this would be that commercials often showed images of curtains blowing in a breeze, and it makes keeping things in your home smelling fresh a breeze, so it just seemed to make sense. Speaking of a breeze, if you're still here enjoying the video, you know, it's a breeze to hit the like button and subscribe. Plus, it helps the channel out a lot. I appreciate you. After rushing to check the spelling on the bottle and not being able to find any alternate spellings in the past, this theory was pretty much squashed. We all often misspell words, even ones we see and use on a daily basis. So it's not too far-fetched to believe we could have just missed a letter. But for more theories about how the household item should be spelled, look no further than the Mandela Effect subreddit regarding the topic. Some even thought it was spelled Fabreeze with an A, alluding to the combination of the word fabric and breeze. Although this may seem far-fetched to some, it is also plausible considering the product was used to freshen up fabrics so people could have been combining the words fabric and breeze together inadvertently to come up with Fabrice. Either way, this one, unlike the Fruit of the Loom debacle, is pretty easily debunkable as I've yet to find a bottle in the past or present with any other spelling other than Fabrice. Last on this list, but certainly not least, is the line from the film Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. When the evil queen in the film summons the talking head in her magic mirror, she says a phrase that many remember as mirror mirror on the wall. But we later found out this is actually supposed to be magic mirror on the wall. Magic mirror on the wall, who is the fairest one of all? This Mandela Effect had everyone going to dig out their old VHS collections so that they could watch the movie again and test this theory out for themselves. This one has been widely debated as some have found versions with each of the two phrases. In an attempt to explain the discrepancy, some attribute it to our brains naturally filling in gaps in our memory with what seems to make the most logical sense while others attribute it to just mishearing like we do with song lyrics. We've all confidently sung the lyrics to our favorite songs for years until one day someone stops us and tells us, hey, you know that's not how the song goes, right? Which inevitably prompts the rapid Googling of said song lyrics, thus leaving people questioning what they thought they heard all those years. But in the case of the Snow White line, it's important to note that there are several versions of the film out there but typically people usually remember and refer to the Disney version released back in 1937. As we all know, Disney loves a good remake, as they even have yet another release of the Snow White film coming, this time a live action one set to hit theaters in 2025. But the animated version is the one where people swore they heard that phrase. The 1937 Disney film was based off the original German folktale Snow White, written by Brothers Grimm back in the 1800s. The same authors that brought us tales like Cinderella, Rumpelstiltskin, and more. Snow White, as well as all their other folktales, were originally published in German. One reason there's so much confusion surrounding this Mandela effect is the fact that Grimm's folklore has been translated hundreds, maybe even thousands of times. And in researching, I come across versions that say everything from mirror mirror to magic mirror to even looking glass on the wall in earlier versions of the text. But not only has the written text been translated numerous times, 
It was also made into several film adaptations. Besides Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, there was also another popular film that does a take on the Brothers Grimm fairy tale by Roth Films Production Company distributed by Universal Pictures called Snow White and the Huntsman, which also uses the phrase mirror, mirror. Mirror, mirror. On the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Another part of the confusion here comes from the fact that when discussing the nostalgic Disney film in conversation, many tend to casually drop the Seven Dwarfs part of the title, instead simply referring to the film by the titular character's name, Snow White. In addition, the fact that the text has been translated from German as much as it has, it's certain some words would have gotten lost in translation, or even purposely changed to make more sense in whatever the target language would end up being. As for which version is correct, well, technically they both are, depending on the context. But if referencing the iconic Disney film, then the line would be Magic Mirror. Needless to say, this one did baffle the internet for quite some time. And even though it's been debunked as both being correct, depending on which version of the film you're watching, many still think the line Mirror Mirror on the Wall just seems to flow better. But maybe that's just because that's the version most of us are used to hearing. The world of Mandela effects is truly an interesting one, and for those that love the world of sci-fi or a good conspiracy rabbit hole, it's an entertaining one to dive into. Some of these Mandela effects have been disproven without a shadow of a doubt, while others the masses are still speculating about. But it sure is fun to dive into, regardless of whether or not the mystery is solved. But I want to hear from you guys. Did any of these Mandela effects surprise you? Do you think the explanation for these is alternate universes colliding? Are we being gaslit? Or do you think we just have much worse memory than we think we do? Let me know. There are countless other Mandela effects out there that I could cover, so if you really enjoyed this and would like a part two, comment part two down below and I'll be happy to make one. But to keep part two if you found this video educational or entertaining, it would be delightful really delightful if you would like share and hit that subscribe button for more content don't worry i'll wait as always thanks so much for watching and until next time keep learning